royal time should move slowly and by its own laws, creeping, like the flow of chrism from a jar. But, twenty ordinary years have jog-trotted by, and it's possible to have a grown-up conversation with someone who wasn't born when Diana died. Her widower is long remarried. Her eldest son, once so like her, shows signs of developing the ponderous looks of Philip, his grandfather. Diana should be as passé as ostrich plumes, one of those royal or quasi-royal women, like Mary of Tech or Wallace Simpson or the last Tsarina, whose images fade to sepia and whose bones are white as pearls. Instead, we gossip about her as if she had just left the room. We still debate how in 1981 a sweet-faced, puppy-eyed, 20-year-old came to marry into the royal house. Was it a setup from the start? Did she know her fiancé loved another woman? Was she complicit, or was she an innocent, garlanded for the slab and the knife? For some people, being dead is only a relative condition, they reek more than the living do. After their first rigor, they reshape themselves, taking on a flexibility in public discourse. For the anniversary of her death, the princess's sons remember her for the TV cameras, and we learn that she was fun, and very caring, and a breath of fresh air. They speak sincerely, but they have no news. Yet there is no bar on saying what you like about her, in defiance of the evidence. Private tapes she made with her voice coach have been shown in a TV documentary, Diana, in her own words. They were trailed as revealing a princess who is candid and uninhibited, yet never has. She appeared so self-conscious and recalcitrant. 